Praise the Lord. Mm. You know, thank you, Fe. You know, my, my kids call him Bishop. <laughs> thank you, Bishop. <laughs> Praise the name of the Lord. That was uh, a wonderful time of prayer. I pray the Lord will bless us again today in Jesus' name. So today we are going to continue where we left off last week. You know, we started to examine the question, what does it mean to be created in the image of God? That's the question we're examining last week. And by the grace of God, uh, as the Lord enables us, we'll try to tidy up that question today. And I, I pray you and I, Will be blessed in Jesus' name. Let, let me let me let me sort of share a story, if you will, before we begin. And you know, as Ife was praying, um, he appealed to the scriptures that the Lord will open the eye of our understanding. And, and as he was praying that prayer, uh, you know, something came to my mind. You know, I came as an immigrant to the United States uh, many years ago. And to cut the long story short, I ended up at Stony Brook University in New York, uh, pursuing a second uh, bachelor's degree. And during that time, you know, God favored me. Um, I was privileged to be selected as a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Fellow or scholar. And, I, you know, I was just there. You know, I was just there. You know, and... While I was there at Stony Brook, I got offered a full scholarship for uh, a DMP program. That's a doctor of nursing practice program. One year into that program, I felt this is not what I wanted to do. <laughs> I, just, I just knew, you know, I don't want to spend my entire life being a clinician. So I made a phone call. I called um, the uh, DC office of uh, Robert W. Johnson Foundation and I spoke to someone. I said, I really don't think this is the right program for me. So this individual said, uh, I should speak to someone at Case Western. So I, I called the man. And uh, the man sort of talked to me, he said, tell me, what are your passions? What do you enjoy doing? What do you love? To cut the long story short, he said, I, I think you are better suited for a PhD program as against the DMP. So that was one year into my DMP program. So the question now is, where do I go for the PhD? So that was the question. So I called Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, you know, again, I spoke to the, uh, one of the program directors, the deputy program director to be specific. And she said, reach out to Penn, reach out to Yale, you reach out to, you know, uh, US, UCSF. Those are the top schools. And in my mind, I was wondering, how do I go about that? So I called one of our pastors. And I, I, I'm telling you this story, I want you to learn from it. So the story is not just about Brother Henry, learn from it. One of the things I personally do, which is biblical, I seek godly counsels from leaders. The pastor I called, the pastor I called, I want you to listen to this, this is very important. The pastor I called has LPN. Those of you who are, um, who are in nursing, you know LPN is just a licensed practical nursing program. That's not even a bachelor's. It's not even as an associate degree. It's less than that. But he's a pastor, so I called him. I say, Pastor, I'm in this situation. I really need to take the next step. I'm not sure what to do. So this pastor, don't forget, he has LPN. At that time, I had a bachelor's and the first year in the doctoral program. He said, Brother Henry, this is what you need to do. I want you to um, clean up your resume and send it to Yale. So I sent it to someone at Yale. And this is where I'm going. This is where I'm going. This is where I'm going with this story. And based on the prayer that Ife prayed. So I sent it to someone at Yale. Um, and we had a phone call. 
And she made a statement that maybe God wanted me to hear that changed my life. She said, from what I see in your resume, there is no college you cannot go to in this country. No college. As soon as she made that statement, it's like my mind just opened up. Because in my mind, I never saw myself going to an Ivy League. I mean, you know, I was just in a state college and, you know, I never dreamed. So cut the long story short, I ended up at Penn and, you know, I've been there for some time. Got a PhD, you know, the rest is story. But the point is this, the point is this, the point is this. There was just one phone call that changed my outlook that changed, sort of opened up my, my mind to possibilities. God wanted me to hear that from a very powerful woman at Yale. In actual fact, during that call, she started making offers to me. I mean, we're gonna give you this, we're gonna make sure you get this, come to Yale. I mean, in my mind, I said Yale, but that call, even though I ended up not going there, but that call, was a defining moment. I say that to say this, that if I prayed, I would let us in prayer to pray that God will open up our mind. And this topic today, I'm telling you, can be a defining moment in your life. I'm telling you. So I want to encourage you to stay engaged. Let's begin. Heavenly Father, we come again before the pages of the scriptures. Lord, help us to hear your words your words that will cause illumination, your words that will cause regeneration, your words that will cause transformation, your words that will catapult us and empower us with new perspectives, new outlook, a new mindset, a new posture, so that we can begin to live the way you want us to live. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, we pray. So today, again, like I said, we're pursuing the question, what does it mean to be created in the image of God? A couple of things I want to go through very quickly, which I said I will continue to remind us again and again. God is all wise, is loving, is truthful, is gracious, is good, and is pure. Don't ever forget that. Don't believe the lie of the enemy. No matter the situation, no matter the circumstances, no matter what you're going through, always remember God is all wise. God is loving. God will not tell you a lie. His word is truth. God is gracious and merciful and loving, and compassionate, and God is holy. We, 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 it's, it's a point you and I need to believe. And last week, we also saw that men and women are the beautiful handiwork of a good and loving God. We saw that last week, that men and women were created to bear the image or the likeness of God, we saw that. And in the creation, we saw that God took such personal attention and care in the making of the first human. That in creating Adam in Genesis chapter two, verse seven, God was depicted as a potter that molded him, that formed him that created him. And in verse 22 of chapter two, in uh, creating the woman, God was presented as a builder. He took a rib from Adam and made a woman. Is this idea of a builder. So the point is this, everything else that God created, God just spoke into existence. But when it came to the creation of 
man, God took such personal care in molding man. And something for you and I to be very excited about. The second uh, uh, thing we sort of highlighted last week is this. You know, what being made in the image of God does not mean, right? We, we, we needed to be very clear. Before we even address what it means, we should know what it does not mean. So we saw last week, it does not mean we are unable to sin. Because Genesis chapter 3 confirms that. Adam and Eve were made in the image of God. But in Genesis chapter 3, they sinned. So definitely it does not mean that being created in the image of God, that humans were unable to sin. We also saw that humans were not created with God's supernatural attributes. So when we say we're created in the image of God, it does not mean we're created with you know, attributes like self-existence, immutability. God is omnipresent. God is omnipotent. God is omniscient. We don't have that. One of the key messages we communicated and people who are, you know, filled with the spirit of God, people who have Jesus living in them, sometimes forget this. And it was very important for us to stress this, that people are only human. We are not divine. That's not, don't miss that. That's a very important point. Because sometimes when you have the spirit of God, don't just talk like you're God. You're not. I'm not God. We can never be God. Yes, we're indwelt by God. We're indwelt by his spirit. But we are still human. We don't become divine. You know, when people, again, communicate and talk as if they are God, hey, be very careful. Obviously, it is clear in scripture that being created in the image of God does not mean that we are divine. So today, in Genesis chapter one, we want to now answer the question in the positive. We've addressed it in the negative next week, what it does not mean. So what does it mean? Genesis chapter one, in verse 26 and in verse 27, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. In verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. The first point I want to stress as we read uh, and reflect on these two verses is this. Precisely what the divine likeness was, which was stamped upon man, we do not know. Precisely. And if you, are a, if you know Bible, you know more than me, please, I would love to have that conversation with you. If you know precisely with exactness what it means, please, I would love to hear from you. Because the Bible didn't give us that exactness. We can only look at the whole scripture and, and see what it is. We know what it is not. But when we look at passages in the scriptures, we are going to begin to see what it is. Right, so, so that's very important, right? That's very important. And that's why we had the conversation we had last week, right? Sister Ifeb spoke, Sister Simi spoke, um, one other sister, uh, the sister from Boston, right, spoke, you know, and everybody, Brother Moses also spoke, you know, saying, oh, the image of God means we possess intelligence. You know, the image of God means we, are, we reflect his likeness, his character. And, you know, I responded by saying, everybody's correct, right? Because they are all correct. 
you know, uh, Bromosis talked about that it reflects the uh, sort of the tripartite, uh, the tri, the unity, the triunity of God, right? God is God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, and we also have spirit, soul, and body. So, so he, he, yeah, he, he, he called our attention to that. But I, I, I want to tell you this, this tension, or this, this, um, you know, um, this. Uh, sort of conversation. Uh, it's a conversation that I started long ago. So there are three views, three views that, you know, theologians, biblical scholars have advanced. And we're going to see those three views and we're going to come to a conclusion by the grace of God and leave this place transformed in Jesus' name. So the first view is the structural view. But a key, a key message as we engage with the structural view is this. Humans are different from the angels and from animals. That's a very important point. The Bible tells us that. The Bible says in Psalm 8 that God has made us a little lower than the angels and has crowned us with honor and glory. So we are different from angels. In Genesis chapter two, which we're going to read, humans are different from animals. So the structural view states, it is our inner capacities of nature that constitute the image of God. So it is this idea that the image of God in man must relate to some way or ways in which we humans are like God, but unlike the other created animals. That's the idea. That's the idea. Let me read Genesis chapter two. Now, I want you to stay glued to your Bible. This is very important. Genesis chapter two. And I want you to read along. I want you to read along. You guys are very yeah, intellectual. So pay attention so that you can come to the knowledge of scripture. Uh, Genesis chapter two, in verse seven, it says, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Man became a living soul. Go to verse 19. Verse 19. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he will call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. So we know something in looking at those two verses, that humans and animals share in creatureliness, right? You see that word formed in verse 19. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed. If you go to verse seven, right? The Bible tells us in verse seven, and the Lord God formed out of the dust of the ground. So you see formed, you see ground in both verses, right? So what does that mean? Man and beast share in some physical properties and are related to the environment. So that's what we just read. That's what we just read that God formed man, God formed the animals from the ground. If you take it one step further, this Bible study, the animals were declared in verse, in verse uh, 19, the animals were declared as living creature, right? They were declared as living creature. Right, and if you go to chapter one, you will see the animals presented as living creatures. You go to verse seven, 
Adam was declared as a living soul, as a living being is presented like that in Hebrews. So the point is, man was formed from the dust. Animals were formed from the dust. Animals are living creatures. Man is a living soul. But again, this way, this way we are getting at what does it mean to be created in the image of God? We are getting, we are getting there. And if, if you are a, a student of the Bible, you're already analyzing two ver- those two verses and you can respond to the answer. Because since humans and other animals are all created beings, those aspects that we share in common with them cannot constitute what distinguishes us from them, right? So, so that's something to hold that thought and, and think about that. Since we are made in the image of God, it must refer to some re, uh, sort of uh, resemblance to God in particular that God impacted to humans and it's not shared by animals. So I just want to make sure we're all reading that. We're all staying connected. We are staying connected. So my question then is, and anybody unmute and share, what's the difference between verse 7 and verse 19? Because that will get us to this view of what it means to be created in the image of God. Anyone? Don't feel shy. (laughs) Verse 7 and verse 19. I've showed you the commonalities. So what's the difference? And it's not a trick question, though. (laughs) Not a trick question. Anyone? Verse 7 and verse 19. All right. Let, let me let me respond since uh, this the group is quiet today. There are comments in the comment section. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not. I, I I didn't see that. I apologize. All right. So humans have a conscience and a soul, which animals don't. Okay. Uh, Precious was more precise, um, and I'll go with that. She was more precise, and she said the breath of life. Right the breath of life, because the animals did not have that, right? It's humans that um, had the breath of life. So in verse seven and in verse 19, we see a distinction between humans and animals. That distinction is sharply maintained. So the source of animal life is attributed you know to sort of an intermediary which is the ground from which they came forth god spoke and they came from the ground but man was formed in verse 7 and his fountain of life was the divine breath right so don't let anybody tell you we're animals now you are beginning to know you are, you are not an animal. You are different. Animals don't have the breath of life. The Bible says, and God breathed or breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. So let's look at verse two very closely. I mean, verse seven very closely. There are two elements in verse seven. And stay with me. There are two elements in verse seven. Let's, let's, let's unpack that verse. And the Lord God formed. That's one verb. So there is this element of making. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. You now see another verb and breath. Right? So there is making and there is giving, right? The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground 
and breath into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. So man received his life force from the breath of God, the creator himself, hovering over man. And, and, and this notion of breath is warmly personal, right? It's personal. You know, those of us who are in the healthcare field, sometimes you, you give somebody CPR. Somebody is, has passed out and you administer breath. You administer breath. Is warmly, in this context, warmly personal. There are two theologians that espouse the structural view. Many of you know Augustine of Hippo. So he understood the image of God as the reflection of the triune persons of God. This is what Bromosis was appealing to last week. Mirrored in the distinct yet unified intellectual capacities of memory, intellect, and will. So that's the structural view. Augustine of Hippo says, no, that's, that's, that's my understanding. As I read these verses, there is a reflection. Let us make man the triunity of God. And you, you see, man developing certain cap capacities, capacity for memory, for intellect, for will, will to make a choice, memory to recall, intellect to exercise judgment, to create, to design things. So that's, that's, that's the position of Augustine of Hippo. Iranius, one of also the church fathers, he looked at Genesis chapter one, In verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So he separates image and likeness. He says, the image of God is our reason, our volition. And the likeness of God is our holiness, our spiritual relationship to God. So that's, that's his own uh, trying to understand this verse. So the point he was making is this, and, and, and this is something uh, you need to reflect on, is that as a result of the fall, man lost the likeness of God, but did not lose the image of God. So think about this. Think about this. Before the four, man had creative abilities and intelligence. You bring the animals, name them. When Adam and Eve fell, they didn't lose that creative ability. It's just that if you look at chapter two and chapter three, the difference is this. Everything Adam did before the fall, God endorsed it. But their first product that they created after the fall was to make themselves close. That's the first product that product did not match up with God's desire. That's why God had to make them close from animal uh, skin. But the point is this, they did not lose their intellect, their ability to create. Natural fact, if you go chapter uh, uh, four uh, and you begin to see the, the father of, of technology, the father of music, those people were not Christians. The children of Lamech that are, that are the pioneers of technology and music, they were not Christians. In fact, Lamech married two women. He, was a, he started polygamy. So Eranios is arguing and saying, because of sin, we lost the likeness of God, which we can re regain in redemption when we put our faith in Christ Jesus. But we did not lose the image of God. So that, that I, I just wanted you to reflect on his own uh, uh, analysis, looking at this scripture closely. 
He said, no, let's separate the image of God from the likeness of God. And the image of God has to do with, you know, reason, you know, the capacity to reason, the capacity uh, to exercise a will. Uh, and the likeness of God has to do with that quality of holiness, of relationship with God. In fact, before we go to the next view, my question to you is this. Can you say that you are reflecting the likeness of God? Can you say by the grace of God that you are living a holy life? You are living a godly life. That you have a personal, active, vital relationship with a holy God. You know, the Bible says God is of a purer eyes than to behold iniquity. Can you say, by God's grace, I not only have the image of God, but I also have the likeness of God. So that's the structural view. So the structural view says, humans have capacities that animals do not have. We can reason, we can exercise our will, we can, we can have a relationship with a holy God. Right? So, so that's, the, that's the, the, the structural view. There's also the relational view. So the relational view, those who have looked at these two verses, the relational view is that being in the likeness of God is our human and Godward relationality that's the idea they said when you think about that human relationality our godward relationality that's what comprises the image of god and again it's still from this verse right that that the, those who argue from this perspective they see the image of god Referring to not just some aspects of our nature, but our relationship to one another and to God. So those who hold this view argue that while it is true that God has given us reason and soul and volition and capacities of nature, none of these things constitute the image of God. Their position or their understanding is that it is the use of these capacities in relation, in relationship with God and others is what clearly reflects what it means to be created in the image of God. Another theologian argues for this position. Uh, many of you, if you if you if you if you use Bible commentaries, you will have come across this name, Carl Bath. You know. You know, it's, it's someone who, who has written quite a bit. He, his, his position is this. God, in verse 26, deliberately speaks of himself in the plural as creating man who is likewise plural. So, so that's his argument. That the image of God should be seen as the relational or social nature of human life as God created us, that both male and female together are created in his image signals the relational meaning of the image of God. <laughs> so, so, so that's, that's the view presented here. I'll, I'll give you one more view, then we'll tie it all together. Another view is the functional view. And again, it's anchored on verse 26 and verse 28. So the image of God is the functioning of man, which is responsible to act as God's representative over creation that shows us as his images, right? So, so this view is that the image of God has to do with function. Creation stewardship as God's vice regents 
is at the heart of what it means to be in the image of God, right? Because when you go to verse 26, so they say, if you look at verse 26 and 28, these two words, dominion over, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Let's go to verse 28 also. Verse 28 says, it says, uh, um, let me read the entire thing. And God blessed them and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. And listen now, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So the argument here for this view is that is that function as God's representative that is what it means to be created in the image of God. And another theologian, Leonard Vadduin, he has argued that the double reference in Genesis chapter 1 in verse 26 and 27 of man having dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air cannot be accidental. He, is, he presents that this links the concept of the image of God with the fact that God places man over the rest of his earthly creation in order to rule them. Because he is saying that, the Bible says, and God said, let us make man in an image after our likeness and let them have dominion, right? So he's connecting, making the image and the likeness with dominion, with functioning. But, but the important thing you and I need to uh, pay attention to is this. Yes, this view has some biblical merit. But think about this. Function always and only follows essence. So what, what does that mean? Sometimes words can be very complex. What something can do is an expression of what it is, right? So if you argue for function, then we need to go back to essence because what someone can do is an expression of what it is, right? You say something is a car, something is an airplane. That function is a reflection of essence. So that, that, that's something. So yes, there is the function element, but we cannot separate that from the essence or the being, being created in the image of God, right? So the extent that human are made in the image of God has to do with humans functioning in a certain way. And behind this must be the truth about being made in a certain way, right? So we must think of the image of God in man as involving both. That's, that's the main idea. What he is and what he does, involving both. God has made us a particular way and has done so for us to function in a threefold arena of relationality, right? You know, relationship with God, relationship with others, and relationship with our world, right? So the function and the essence as we interact with our world communicates what it means to be created in the image of God. So let's, let's summarize, let's summarize, let's summarize. So in summary, you know, you've seen those three views. In summary, if we tie it all together, biblically, we can reach some conclusions. So in summary, it means when we say we are created in the image of God, it means we have the capacity for rational thought. You will see this argument of reason, of intelligence. And that's what Sister uh, Ife said last, last week. Humans have an intelligence 
We have a capacity to reason. We have a capacity to evaluate things. We have a capacity to criticize ourselves, criticize others. We have a capacity to ask questions. Human beings can think, we can reason, we can debate, we can argue. We are self-conscious. So that's a component of being created in the image of God. Humans have the capacity for moral choice. And a brother Jerry or sister Joy, I don't know, one of them left a message. We have a conscience, all right? We have the capacity for moral choice. Humans have a conscience, animals don't. They don't have a conscience. We have a capacity to recognize moral values and make moral choices. We see that in, in scripture. Let me just read one verse in Hebrews chapter 10. I know you have the scriptures, but let me read it. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. I want to read in verse 22. Hebrews chapter 10 in verse 22. The Bible says, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Chapter 13, chapter 13, verse 18 of that same book. The Bible says, pray for us for we trust we have a good conscience. You see that earlier verse speaks of an evil conscience. Here the Bible speaks of a good conscience that empowers the person that because of a good conscience, the person lives honestly. The person makes sound moral choices, chooses godly moral values, right? So humans are aware, we are aware of, a moral order outside of and above us to which we are accountable. We see this in our society, right? We have the inner urge to do what we believe to be right. And when we do wrong, we have a profound sense of guilt. Animals don't have a moral sense. Then the Bible speaks of humans having the capacity for artistic creativity. Again, humans can have dominion. So that's that third view of functioning. We can have dominion. Human have, humans have the capacity to exercise lordship over creation, to subdue the earth, to be creative. After God created man, he gave man intelligence. And man use his God-given intelligence to do things. Look at, look at what man has been able to do. Look all around you. Look at the skyscrapers. Look at, look at the bridges. Look at, look at, look at cars. You know, look at, look at houses. Look at buildings. You know, God made us creative creatures like himself. Humans can dream and design things. Humans are both imaginative and innovative. Humans can appreciate what is beautiful to the eye, to the ear, to the touch. You see something nice, you say, well, this is nice. This is beautiful, look at that design. You know, I've attended some sessions where people present, and in my mind, I see what people do with slides. I'm telling you, fascinating stuff. Because humans can create. We can, we can dream, we can design things. That's part of being created in the image of God. Obviously, humans also have capacity for social relationship. We have capacity for social relationships. Humans have a society. We have the capacity to love and to be loved in a personal and social way. You know, you say, oh, I love them, my brother. I love that my sister, I just, my sister, I, I just thank God for you. My brother, I just thank God for you. Can we find some time to have lunch together? I just want us to just talk. How are you? We have capacity for authentic relationships. Yes, animals can mate. 
and reproduce and care for their young. But as humans, we hunger for the authentic relationships of love. Christians know why love is preeminent. It is because God is love. And in God's um, creating us, when he made us, he gave us the capacity to love and to be loved. And we also see that in Genesis chapter 2, right? Right there, God said it's not good for a man to be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. But let me make a point. This capacity for social relationship is not only in the context of marriage. Paul, the apostle, never got married. Created in the image of God. But he had authentic relationships with other saints, both men and women. Godly relationships. You hear him mention people like Phoebe. You know, I know Sister Phoebe is here. That's why I mentioned that name. Fortunatus and other names, right? Silvanus, you know, Aquila and Priscilla. Authentic relationships. That's what it means to be created in the image of God. Then we have the capacity for humble worship. Humans have a soul. We saw that, that when he breathed, the breath into us. We became a living soul. We have the capacity to worship, the capacity to pray, the capacity to live in communion with God. That's why materialism cannot satisfy the human spirit. You see people who are very wealthy, they go commit suicide. Very rich. Because materialism cannot satisfy the human spirit. That's why the Bible says man does not live by bread alone. We know instinctively that there is a transcendent reality beyond the material order. And what that means is we are most truly human when we are worshiping God. That's why when Satan came with his temptation, Matthew chapter 4, Jesus said, Thou will worship the Lord your God, only him you will serve. The Bible said, The hour cometh when true worshipers will worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. And in truth. So, in conclusion, being created in the image of God includes the rational, moral, social, spiritual faculties which make man or humans unlike all other creatures and like God, the creator. These capacities, our mental, social, creative, spiritual capacities or faculties constitute the divine image of God. God not only gave us rational personality, he not only gave us minds to think, emotions to feel, he gave us wills to choose, to make decisions. He also gave us the inner spiritual nature so that we can know him and worship him. Humans can have a special relationship with God. Do you have a special relationship with God? Do you know him? Are you reflecting the image of God? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. I want to ask you from what you've heard today, can you truly say you are reflecting the image of God? Can you truly say as you reflect on what we've seen from God's word, can you truly say that in all aspects, relationship to God, relationship to your world, relationship with others, in your functioning, in the use of your intelligence, your mind, your creativity, as it relates to social authentic relationships, in the exercise of your will to make choices that honor God, can you truly say, you are reflecting the image of God. 
That's what we've come to learn today. And I pray you and I will leave this place and truly, truly live as God has created us to live in his image. Over to you, Sister Fortune.